Let's rise and pray. Oh, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the bright sun, Lord. We thank you for a place to worship and to congregate. And we thank you for brothers and sisters in faith, Lord. We thank you for your spirit and your precious blood of Jesus, Lord. See into our hearts now and do what it is that you do and only you can do, Lord. Uh, we know that you are among us now, Lord, and we give you honor and glory. In your precious name, Jesus, amen. Amen. God is able. He will never fail. He is almighty God. Greater than all we seek, greater than all we ask, he has done great things, lifted up, he defeated the Let's give thanks to the Lord for he is good because his mercy endureth forever. His mercy endureth forever. Amen. Amen. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness he humbled himself and he carried the cross love 
love so amazing, love so amazing, Jesus Messiah. You for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, His body the Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sin. Please be seated. All right. Good morning and welcome to the service this morning. We're glad that you are here today. You are round two. Um, our Spanish service had a big baptism service this morning, and which is great. That was a big highlight for them. 
And then in our English service, we moved downstairs today and there were almost 80 of us. So a uh, big crowd coming early, I guess summer, they want to get in and get out. So hopefully soon in the weeks to come, we'll all come back together into the one service because I'm sure you miss seeing some people. Uh, but we're glad that you're here today, and I know other people are still trying to get in parking lots and all of those kind of things, but we're glad you're here for the service today. Um, I want to give you a couple of announcements just so you kind of know um, uh, a little bit about what direction that we are going. Uh, today, after the service, um, uh, at 2 o'clock, there's a memorial service for Rick Atwood. Some of you who've been here for many years will remember Rick and Dee Dee. Uh, and they were faithful attenders here for many, many years, and several years moved away and uh, go, uh, moved south. And uh, uh, on Christmas Day 2019, Rick very tragically died. Um, and then COVID hit, and very soon after that, Dee Dee uh, had to come back to New York to take care of her mother, who is uh, very, very poor health. And so uh, just has really never been able to have a, a service to kind of get some closure. So today at two, just a brief, small service. Um, so for those of you who uh, knew Rick and uh, know DD, want to invite you to come. You can use the funeral home parking lot. Uh, they're going to let us do that, and the service will be right here at two. So uh, be praying for DD, and if you can make it, we want to invite you to do that. And then next week uh, on Saturday, July 3rd, 4th of July weekend, July 3rd, we will have our men's breakfast at 9 a.m. So guys, last month we did not, um, could not, we had to reschedule for a lot of reasons, but we will, even if it's just Pop-Tarts and Lucky Charms, we're going to do it, and uh, actually we've got guys that are going to cook. So July 3rd, 9 o'clock, uh, we'll be here guys for that, it's a great way to start the holiday weekend. And then ladies, uh, you will not meet this month, um, there's going to be something in early August and the uh, uh, we'll keep you updated about that, all right? Then next Sunday, 4th of July is Sunday next week. So may I encourage you not to forget God on the 4th of July, okay? So we want to invite you to come. We will have that early service and the later service, but I want to encourage you to come at 11 uh, afterward. We're going to have a barbecue out in the yard, and uh, we'll be able to have time of fellowship and meet people, see people perhaps you haven't seen for a long time. And then you'll still have plenty of time to go do all your family stuff. So I want to encourage you to come, honor God. <clears throat> We're going to remember our country, be praying for our country, and uh, it'll be a good service. So I want to encourage you to be here for that. And then uh, as we move forward in July, we have a baptism service scheduled for uh, three weeks from today. And uh, we'll tell you more about that, but that's a highlight. We've, we've been very thankful to see so many people get saved and baptized uh, here in the last... Um, several months and so that'll be an, a, an encouraging day and then at the end of the month <clears throat> is our vacation bible school july 26th through the 30th and uh, there are some things you can do uh, for us as it pertains to that week it's every night monday through friday 6 to 8 30 it's fast it's furious it's organized chaos but it's great it's one of the biggest uh, outreaches that we have every year we're looking forward to it. We've got a real good staff already. Claire Bloom is really helping us oversee that. She's doing great. But we could use your help in many areas. One, pray. So if you're, if you're not doing that, if you put that on your prayer list, pray for our Vacation Bible School, the kids that will come, and the parents and families will meet. Two, if you'd still like to help, we could use help. Um, we're, we're going to do VBS here, and then we're going to do a traveling Vacation Bible School in one of our local parks and so we'll have a whole volunteer staff there every night because there are kids that won't come here. Parents won't let them come here, but we'll catch them in the park. So we could still use your help, and if you're willing, uh, let us know, and we'd be glad to get you connected. And then lastly, if you have kids or family has kids or your neighbors have kids, uh, let them know about Vacation Bible School. There's flyers at both doors, and uh, you can pass those out and help us promote it. We've got a good response so far, so we're looking forward to that, and we're excited about that. So those are some things upcoming for you. I really want to encourage you. Uh, I know many of you are, are going away and getting away, and we're, we're, we just, summer's here for us, and so, um, and we want you to get away and enjoy your time, but when you're in town, I want to encourage you to be faithful and be here in the house of the Lord, 
and uh, ministry is happening and good things are happening. Uh, our adult Bible classes are doing really well all throughout the week. And if you're not connected to one of those and you'd like to be, uh, just ask and we'll, we'll, we'll let you know how you can get connected. So uh, thank you for being here today. Also, um, I want to encourage you, if you did not, because in a moment we're going to observe communion. And today um, we have that opportunity to do that. So if you did not there at the table, go by and pick up your elements if you want to participate. And in just a moment, we're going to partake. You know, communion is one of two ordinances that Jesus gave to the church. And uh, these little elements, the little bread, the uh, fruit of the vine, they are not the body of Jesus you're not ingesting his physical body and blood. You'd be a cannibal if you did that. That, that. that is not his body and blood. It doesn't somehow become it as you ingest. It, it's not the aura of the body and blood. Quite frankly, it's a little wafer and it's a little bit of grape juice. Uh, it, it is to serve as a memorial, as a reminder of what Jesus did for us. And in Matthew chapter 26... Uh, I'm going to read that passage here in just a moment, but in Matthew chapter 26, we find that Jesus introduces this um, uh, ordinance while he is at a Passover Seder. And if you remember, the Seder or Passover meal was a big celebration that Jewish people even to this day still have. Many of you have been to our Passover Seders, time for them to remember uh, uh, God's deliverance uh, from the Jewish people out of Egypt. And so while Jesus is sitting there in what we would call the upper room, he reaches and he takes the elements off of the Seder plate, which would be matzah, which would be fruit of the vine. Uh, you know, no leaven would be allowed on the table. So he was not drinking, you know, corn liquor. He, he's drinking fruit of the vine, grape juice. And he uses those elements and he says, look, Listen to me, guys, you don't understand it now, but one day you will. And when you meet together and when you meet to remember me, take these elements and let them help you serve uh, as illustrations and as reminders. And so today, uh, we want to do that. The Bible says if you've trusted the Lord as your Savior, you put your trust in Him, you follow the Lord in believer's baptism, you've had that opportunity to identify with Him and you've done that, and then the Bible says, if you've examined your heart, you've searched your heart, um, the Bible says not to partake of uh, communion uh, with uh, uncleanness in your life. Much like I, as a parent, would tell my kids, go wash your hands before you come to the dinner table. Um, Jesus does not want us to make a mockery uh, of, of all that's been done uh, and his death and his burial and his resurrection. And so uh, we need to uh, make sure that we are clean before the Lord today. And so what we'd like to do is take a moment, if you'd bow your heads with me today, and uh, let's bow. And uh, would you just take a moment, search your heart, and uh, in a moment we'll read Matthew chapter 26. Uh, but let's uh, take a moment, search our heart today. What I've found in my own life, it's not that I don't know what I've done wrong, it's that I, I'm not willing to... to to address it, and so today I want to encourage you to do that, and uh, let's take a moment before we proceed. Dear Lord, I'm so thankful that we get to partake today in communion, or we're thankful that you are our Messiah. Uh, Lord, you are the name above all names. You are that blessed redeemer. You are Emmanuel. God, we're thankful that you left heaven and that you came to earth and you did so to die on the cross for our sins, to pay that penalty. Lord, we get busy in life and uh, not even intentionally, Lord, but sometimes we forget. And so thank you for really leaving us a command to help us to remember what you've done for us. So Lord, I pray that we'd search our hearts today that we will not partake, uh, as the Bible says, unworthily, but we'll be pure before you 
And today as we partake, Lord, we pray, help us to remember your death, your burial, and your resurrection for us. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In Matthew uh, chapter 26, Jesus is there and uh, he's with the disciples at the Seder and he picks up the, the bread and the Bible says, and while they were eating, Jesus took the bread and then he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to the disciples. And let's take a moment and let's give God thanks today for his body that was broken. Lord, thank you for your body broken for us. Lord, thank you for paying that ultimate price on Calvary. And we know that you came to earth and took upon you the form of a man so that you could be vulnerable, so that you could be killable. And you uh, died for us. And so today, Lord, thank you for bearing our sins in your own body on the tree. So help us to do what we do in remembrance, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And it says that he gave it to them, he blessed, he broke it, and he said, take eat, this is my body. If you want to take a minute and undo that second seal there. The Bible says in verse uh, 27, then he took the cup. And he gave thanks, and he gave it to them. Of course, this represents the blood of Jesus. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sins. From early on, um, God had set the example, the standard, even from the Garden of Eden, that something innocent had to die for the sins uh, of, of the guilty. And Jesus came and shed his blood to atone to be our sacrifice, to be our substitute. Um, let's pray. Can we do that and give God thanks for the blood? Lord, thank you for the blood that was shed. We're reminded Isaiah said that you would be wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace would be upon you, and by your stripes we would be healed. And Lord, we're thankful for the blood that was shed so that we might be forgiven, we might be cleansed, that, Lord, we might... Uh, be free. And so as we partake today, let us remember and do so with a heart of thanks, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. He gave it to him and he said, take and uh, drink. This is my blood, which is in the New Testament, which is done for many for the remission of sins. Then he would say, I will no longer eat or drink of this the fruit of the vine until the day that I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. That was the last time that Jesus partook, first and last. And the next time that he partakes, it will be in heaven with us. And what an exciting time that will be. And uh, we look forward to, to that day. But until then, we're to do what we do to remember. And uh, we're to do all that we can to share uh, Jesus' sacrifice with others. The Bible says that they all went out and they sung a hymn. And they continued on. So we're going to continue our worship today. Uh, we're going to stand and we're going to worship the Lord in song today. And as we do, we're going to dismiss the boys and girls to go downstairs. So kids, you can go right downstairs to Kids Church. And the rest of us, let's lift our voice as we worship.
Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness is bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior! Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Oh, what a Savior, isn't he one? to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to Him. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me.
the night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, he will stay. I hold my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley he will lead oh the night has been won and I shall overcome yet not I but through Christ in me no fate I dread, I know I am forgiven, the future sure, the price it has been paid, for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave, to this I hold. Thank you so much. And I hope that that's your testimony today. If Christ has made a difference in your life and if Christ has changed you, then uh, hopefully uh, not only have you embraced that, but that that evidence is there in your life and that you uh, want to do all you can to make it known. Uh, we are really glad that you're here today. If you're visiting, thanks for being here. We have a big group from Sunnyside Baptist Church in Kingsport, Tennessee. Uh, it's where my, my parents and my sister attend. They've been here all week doing a lot of ministry. We've probably hung hundreds of, of Gospels of John and Romans, and they helped at the pantry and spoke at teen night, just did a lot of things. Big blessing to us this week, and I hope you'll go by and introduce yourself to them. They're leaving tomorrow to head home, so be praying for them. We had a big mission team here early this morning from Birmingham, Alabama, so uh, we're always thankful for people coming into town here to do ministry. The, 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 the city is, is ripe for people that need Jesus, so uh, we're thankful that you guys are here with us this week. Um, and uh, if you're just getting in, again, um, a lot of announcements and upcoming events, check the website, go to Facebook, absolutely you can follow and keep up to date with things on our page. 
uh, as well. I think it's great for uh, us to hear from other people and how God has worked in their life. And uh, you know from time to time we try to ask people to share testimonies and share what God has done in their life. And we've done that today. So I'm going to have one of our members. Many of you know him. If you don't, you'll get the opportunity to meet him. Uh, that's Tazbir Hassan. Taz going to come and he's going to just kind of share his testimony today. We're glad his family's here as well. Give Taz a big hand. Come on down, Taz. <laughs> I had to trick him to do this, but he was willing to, no, he, he was willing to do it, and I'm very glad that he's doing that today. He's going to go up, I think. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, nice to see a lot of familiar and old faces. Nice to see the new people as well. Very friendly. Pastor said it would be very intimidating to look out here, but not the case. Thank goodness. Thank God. Um, in thinking through how I was going to give my testimony, I tend to overthink. I was structuring it in many different ways. I practiced it with my family. That went smoothly. No notes. No nothing. I did it at the men's prayer. I thought I would be ready, but when I saw unfamiliar faces, I was like, oh. I, I forgot a lot of things. So I, I wrote down a few things. I won't be reading too much, but uh, just bear with me. So I thought the best way to do this is to really do it through the most common questions people ask me. Because if you see me, I don't look like the typical Baptist person, right? So it's like, especially with the last name of Hassan, they're always asking, you know, what religion were you growing up as? And, you know, I wouldn't say I actually had a religion growing up. My family with the last name of Hassan is obviously Muslim. But it was not something I chose. It was something I was born into, and out of respect for my parents, I acknowledge all of their traditions, their customs, and just grew up, you know, just making everyone happy. But it never really hit home like how Christianity hit home here. So, you know, when I was asking questions, I didn't get the responses that hit home to me. A lot of people were doing things just out of customs, and I never understood why. So even in the religious prayers, when I went to ask, you know, why are we doing it this way, one person actually said to me, brother, we don't ask questions, we just do what God has told. And that was very difficult to comprehend for a person like me who's very inquisitive, as the pastor will tell you. It took a while for him to, to kind of answer all of my questions, which was great. That was a great reason for why, you know, I, I decided to take Christ as my savior. Because he was able to answer a lot of my questions, which I'll get to in a bit. How did you come to Christ is the other question. So it's through my beautiful wife and my lovely children. I met my wife in high school. She was Baptist. And before dating, she asked, are you okay if our children are Christian? I said, I have no objections. As long as they're good people, that's okay with me. So they attended church, and when I saw them attending church, as, as any dad would, I asked them, you know, what are you listening to? How do you feel? Is everything okay? They said, everything is great. So still as a protective dad, I wanted to see in person. So I attended. I was welcomed by a lot of you, uh, very friendly. Not what I expected, to be, to be honest. I, I felt a little intimidated at first, given my background. I didn't think I would be welcomed, but I was by, by great people here, Pastor Dave, uh, everyone here, you know, through missionary trips and, and everything, it was just such a pleasant experience. Um, I did discipleship. The pastor, like I said, answered a lot of my questions. A lot of it hit home. I think the final one was, you know, all of this makes sense, pastor. I'm not going to fight it. But if I've never actually seen Christ, how do I take him as my savior? And he very smartly said, do you have faith in your wife? I said, I do. And he said, do you see her every second of the day? I said, I don't. So he said, how do you know that you can have faith in her? I said, just through time and experience, it's just a feeling that I have. So then he said, have you had a pleasant journey thus far? I said, yes, I have. This has been a great experience. So he said, why fight, why fight it? If you had a great experience thus far, why not take that same leap of faith in Christ that you did with your wife and everyone else? And I didn't want to fight that anymore. So I said, yes, thank you. So I, I got baptized about six years ago, and, you know, it's been a great experience. Um, how did your family react when they found out? That's, that was not so good, <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, they questioned why. Um, I told them it's just something that I feel, you know, there were some arguments at times, especially during holidays. 
their holidays, our holidays, you know, they, they asked, why aren't you coming here? My answer was, I have to go to church. It wasn't pleasant, but I'm not giving up in my faith that if I can change a couple more people in my family, I will very much try to do so. What are your thoughts on people who have not accepted Christ as their savior? You know, I've been taught to treat everyone the same. Um, and one can make a case that if we trust our brothers in Christ to know what to do, we may choose to then spend time with people who are not saved so we can show them, you know, through our own actions what it means to be saved and try to save them too, uh, ideally. So I try to treat everyone the same and where possible lead by example and, and try to plant some seeds. I, the pastor said it's not your job to convert people, which is a very hard thing to do. But if you can plant seeds through testimonies like this, uh, it's a great thing to do. Okay. Why do you go to church? Um, it's a great feeling. It feels very good to be here. It's like my weekly therapy, to tell you the truth. <laughs> and as some of you may know, it's quite expensive to go to therapy. So the giving tide is a good investment. And uh, the pastor is very much, a lot of the time, seems like he's speaking right to me. I don't know if that's good or bad, but <laughs> it definitely hits home a lot. Um, why did you decide to give your testimony? Uh, as I said, it's good to plant seeds whenever possible. You know, I, I had a, a loss through a very dear friend of mine who was not Christian. <clears throat> and, you know, I was very sad that it was hard to believe that if he didn't take Christ as his savior, he may not go to heaven. So I wanted to take this opportunity to, you know, do this. It's recorded. I'm going to share it with as many people as possible. So hopefully it'll plant some seeds and maybe change a life or two. <clears throat> what are your favorite verses? So I have two. Uh, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Romans 8.31. If God is for us, who can be against us? Uh, question eight. I'm almost done. So <laughs> why do you pray? You know, I think prayer is essential. It keeps me grounded. Um, there's been times, especially through the pandemic, where I think all of us being confined in our homes don't feel the best and we don't know why. So I think prayer grounds me, um, helps me to start the day, uh, give thanks, ask for forgiveness, and ask for strength in terms of um, meeting my daily tasks. Sometimes it feels overwhelming with work, family, everything else. But one of the key things I've learned is trust God and let go. Let go and, and let God, as, as people say. So that helps a lot. How do I pray? So this part I'm actually going to read because every time I pray, it's very different. But I, I wrote this one down yesterday. So there's three steps of prayer. Step number one, give thanks. So this is what I wrote uh, last night. Today I have so many things to thank you, Lord, especially for the wonderful day where I was given a chance to share my testimony. I thank you for my wife, my parents, my children, my extended family, including my church family, my job, my coworkers, my clients, even my creditors, my neighbors, my landlord, my friends, my mentees, and all the people who cross my path. Step two of prayer, ask for forgiveness. May God forgive me for my pride. May God forgive me for my ingratitude. May God forgive me for my arrogance. May God forgive me for my lack of apathy. May God forgive my laziness. May God forgive my indifference. May God forgive my insensitivity. May God forgive my coldness, but more than all, God forgive me, my abandonment, and my forgetting himself, become my neighbor. Ask for what you need is step three. Since everything is yours, Lord, I pray, Lord God, Father, God bless my life, may God bless my health, may God bless my heart, may God bless my home, God bless my family, God bless my job, may God bless my spiritual life, may God bless my finances, God bless my projects, uh, and for all those baseball fans out there, uh, God bless the baseball season of the Mets and Yankees. And let us have a Subway World Series like in 2000. So New York wins no matter what. Um, fun fact, year 2000 was not the first time New York teams were in the World Series. It actually happened two times before, 1955 and 1956. The Brooklyn Dodgers beat the Yankees in 55. I, I, I looked this up yesterday, it was the first time I knew. <laughs> And in 56, the Yankees beat the Mets. I'm oh, sorry, the, the Dodgers. Hopefully this year is the Mets win because the Yankees have had enough. <laughs> uh, I'm really hoping and praying. Uh, all jokes aside, may God bless me and my family, including church family, in abundance so we can give back more. 
God, you're my strength. I need you. Heal me and heal my family uh, and my church family, including Miss Fa Miss Fanny and everybody else that's sick, and the whole world. Just as water falls from the sky, I pray the greatest blessings will fall into all of you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Um, the last question is, how did Christ change me? I hope it was for the better, you know, <laughs> but you guys would know better than me. Um, I think one thing I'll, I'll point out is that a lot of times, you know, we consider ourselves as good people, but we set ourselves to our own standards, which, which can fail at times. Sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't. So to have a common ground, a common focal point such as the Bible has been a great blessing. When times I'm not sure, I look at the Bible. Um, and la I guess one more for one second. What will you say to God when you meet him? I will say thanks, I will say sorry, and, uh, and that I love you. Thank you. I hope that was a blessing to you. I think it's great to hear from people, and uh, we're really proud of, of Taz uh, and his family. And, uh, you know, if you've been around uh, him, you know I, that there's a change, and that's a great thing. And I appreciate you, you sharing. And, uh, um, and we're proud of, of you. He's going through discipleship, as several people are, and uh, it's really about continuing to grow. And uh, he's a great example, really, of what we're going to uh, look at today from Jesus' words in John 15. Um, but we're all on that journey of growth, and um, we just continue to keep growing in the Lord. And so um, we're excited. Be praying for Taz, pray for Jessica, Jasmine, Tatiana, and pray for their family. And thanks for sharing that today. We really appreciate that. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to John 15 uh, for, for just a few minutes this morning. John chapter 15. And if you don't have a Bible, it's okay. We'll have it on the screen. Uh, and we're going to look at a very familiar passage of Scripture uh, that uh, most of us have read. Uh, it's part of the I Am uh, teachings and lessons that Jesus taught. And we're going to read uh, just a portion of it in just a moment. I know today the Bolins last Sunday. Um, we said that before, but this is really the last Sunday for a while. They're moving to Alabama this week. He's, uh, his new uh, location in the, in the Army. So make sure you get by and give them your best and, and uh, wish them well. Be praying for them. Uh, also, a new young couple that's been attending the church, you may or may not know them, Adrian and Daniela Volpe, uh, had their fourth baby this week, a little boy named James, and mom and baby are doing well, so continue to keep Adrian and Danielle and baby James in your prayers, uh, if you would do that. I want to encourage you, next Sunday, it's 4th of July, so we're going to be looking at um, some scriptures, obviously, that have to do with our country and really um, America's hope, I believe. But then after that, and throughout the rest of the month of July, we're going to be doing a new series that I, I'm calling It's Complicated. Uh, if you've been around people, you know that people are blessings, but people are also very complicated. And if you have any kind of relationships, whether it's friendships, boss and, and employee, uh, husband, wife, kids, that neighbor that drives you crazy, how do I interact with people? How, what does God say about my relationships and, and these connections, and God has a lot to say. So during July, we're going to go through scriptures and uh, hope that you'll plan to be here, and I think it'll be helpful to you and encouragement uh, uh, to me as well, and uh, so we'll look forward to that. Okay, John chapter 15 this morning, and have you ever um, been in a rush in the morning and maybe you're getting dressed, guys, and you put on a shirt and you just start butting it and then buttoning it and you get to the bottom and you realize your buttons don't match. Or maybe, ladies, you're putting on a coat, it's wintertime, you're running out the door and it's all messed up and squeegeed and you think, ah. Oh. And so what do you do? You, you've got to uh, undo that top button. The reality is if the top button isn't right, none of the other buttons are going to be right. I mean, you can unbutton all these down here, but if this one is not set where it needs to be, 
then nothing else is going to work. And I think in our lives sometimes, uh, even as Christians, we're trying to go through life and we're trying to fix certain things. And boy, I think Jesus wants me to do this and I need to change that. And, and quite frankly, they're probably a little bit down on the list when it comes to priorities. Our issue is with the top, the top priority. Our issue is our relationship with Jesus. And so instead of just trying to put out one fire after another and trying to fix something and manipulate something or make something work and now I'm a good Christian and, ooh, I got through the day and God's going to be happy with me, we really need to go back to the focal point and we need to evaluate and say, look, is my relationship with God what it needs to be? I am I connected with Him as I need to be? And, and if I am, then everything else will fall into line. So in John chapter 15, Jesus really somewhat speaks to this idea of his, our relationship with him and our growth with him, and then the result of our growth will be that we will produce, we will bring forth fruit. We are to be disciples. If you're, if you're a child of God today, you are described as a disciple of Jesus, a student, a pupil, a follower. And think about this, Jesus had 12 disciples, one of them ends up betraying him, but the other 11 go out and, and change the world. I mean, we're here today, 2,000 years later, with a Bible, with the ability to preach the gospel, and we're able to do that, much in part to the, the ministry, the obedience of these 11 other guys. And if you and I will be willing in our life to grow and we'll be willing to produce, only God knows what he can truly do in our lives and through us. He wants us to bring forth spiritual fruit. So the question is today, am I bringing forth spiritual fruit? A disciple, the Bible says, is a person who loves God more than anything else. It's a person who loves his brothers and more than anything. He, he loves the word of God, but he is also a man or she is also a woman who is a person who is producing or bringing fruit forth in their life. Notice John 15, verse number one. So here's what Jesus says, I'm the true vine and my father's the husbandman. So let me give you a picture Jesus said. Think of me as a bush. I'm rooted, I'm the bush, I'm the base, I'm the stability. My father, God, he's the gardener. Verse two, every branch, that's you, that's me, if we're a Christian. So every branch in me that beareth not fruit, the Bible says, he takes away. We'll talk about that. He gets set aside. But every branch that bears fruit, he purges it so that it may bring forth more fruit. So you see this emphasis on producing in your life. Jesus didn't save us just to kind of sit and be dormant. He didn't save us just to kind of be like, oh, this is awesome, woo, going to heaven, I'll just hang on till that happens. He wants us to produce and reproduce. Growth is a sign of health. Healthy people reproduce. Healthy uh, flowers, healthy trees reproduce. We're to reproduce spiritually. Verse 3, now you are clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. Abide in me, verse 4, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. We get that mixed up sometimes. Whether we'll say it or not, it's kind of like, hey God, here's my life and I got this thing going on and, and I've got a good plan, I need you to bless it. And Jesus said, that's not how it works. We need to flip this. I am the vine. From me comes direction. From me comes resource. From me comes your guidance. From me comes the plan, the design, the blueprint. And, and so you are to be attached to me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. And he that abides in me and I in him, then the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, verse 5, you can do what? Nothing. You can't sit in the pew today if it weren't for Jesus. I can't stand here if it weren't for Jesus. 
Verse number six. Now, if a man abides not in me, then he's cast forth like a branch, and he's withered. And men gather them, and they cast them into the fire, and they are burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Because here it is, verse 8, herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. And by the way, it's when you do that, when I do that, that I get that moniker, that title, now I'm a disciple. So shall you be my disciple. There are people running around, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a disciple of Jesus. Jesus said if there is no fruit, if there is no production, there is no evidence, then, then, then there is something that is contradictory because my disciples will bring forth much fruit. We're to produce because of what Christ has done for us. What has Christ done for us? We just remembered this morning. He saved us. He redeemed us. He forgave us of our sins. How many of you are glad that you're a believer today, that Christ forgave you of all your sins? Hey, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you don't know that your sins are forgiven, you don't know where you'll spend eternity, then we'd like to introduce you to Jesus Christ. He came, he left heaven and came to earth, died, was buried, and rose again, never to die again, to, to live forever. Now he can offer you and me life eternal. The greatest decision you would ever make in life is to receive that gift. Taz talked about that today. Today we remembered what Jesus has done for us. So we remember how he's changed our life. Those of us who've trusted Christ, we're changed forever. We have life eternal not because we come to this church, not because we're religious, not because we try to do good things. The Bible says, he that has the Son, Jesus, has life, and he that has not the Son is not life. Jesus gave to us life eternal, and we should rejoice in that. No matter how bad things might be here, we have life one day. Jesus also gives to us a relationship with the Father. We have a personal relationship with God because of Jesus Christ. And we are not alone. Jesus, when he left, said, look, I, I love you too much. I'm not going to leave you by yourself. So he gives us the spirit of God who indwells us and lives with us and teaches us and convicts us and, and helps us each and every day. All of those things have been done for us by Jesus. And so if I've embraced that and I've accepted him as my savior, I know I'm never alone. I have a home in heaven. My sins are forgiven. I have a relationship with God. Now I'm supposed to go out and share that with people who would want to know the same thing. Taz again mentioned today, planting seeds, letting other people hear this good news. How many of you know people you think would really like to know that they're going to live forever in heaven? How many people do we encounter regularly that just are looking for their sins to be forgiven? So we are now to go and represent Christ. We're to produce. What are we supposed to produce? Well, in the book of Galatians in chapter 5, some of you know this. If not, you can turn there real quick if you want. But we're going to come back to John in a minute. But Galatians chapter 5, the Bible says, let me paint you a picture in Galatians 5. Here's who we were before Jesus. The Bible says in verse 19, the works of our flesh are on display. Before Jesus, here they are. There's adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, which really means just dirty living, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance or contention and quarreling. Uh, jealousy, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, reveling. That's who we were before Jesus. But because of Jesus, verse 22 in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is what? Many of you know it. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, or self-control. So Jesus has radically changed us, transformed us, or he should be. It should be in our lives where you begin to see things different. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul would also talk about it. He, he says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look, don't you know in verse 9 that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Okay, what's unrighteous? 
And he gives us a list. You know, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind. That speaks of the sin of homosexuality. By the way, I know today is Gay Pride Day and the big parade, and, and I get that, and we need to pray for our city. Most of us know people who really are struggling with their identity or struggling with their sexuality. And, and it's sadly, our culture has given so many platforms for people to just feel okay about experimenting things. But the problem is, if it's all outside of God's boundaries, it all leads to brokenness. It leads to tragedy. And, and, and here, here's the reality. God didn't make us uh, to, to be somewhere in between or non-binary or to flip our genders. God didn't make us to, to be in homosexual relationships. When he created us, he created us male and he created us female. And then God said, when I create this sexual uh, activity, it's going to be between a male and a female in, in, in the confines of this thing I call marriage. And, and so God establishes all of these things. And to, to allow and, and to be okay and to approve things outside of what God's design is, it's always going to be trouble. Because there were reasons why God designed it to be that way. That marriage between a man and a woman and, 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 and sex between a husband and a wife, it's all for obviously procreation, but it's for sanctification. It's for illustration. God's, uh, the picture of God and his love toward us as the bride. And so all of that gets thrown out. All of that gets removed when we start bringing in all of these other uh, variables and possibilities. So in God's eyes, homosexuality is sin, just like adultery is sin, and having premarital sex is sin, and being a thief is a sin, and being a liar is a sin. It's sin before a holy God. And so we need to pray for people in our life. We need to pray for people who are struggling. And we need to be producing, reproducing, showing Jesus and showing that, look, there is someone in whom you can have hope. There is someone who has a design for you. There is someone who has a purpose in your life. Because he goes on and he, and he, and he states this, that such were some of you, that some of you were in this capacity, but now you have been changed. Does that have money in that? Could you just send it all down? Just bring it all down. That'd be awesome. All right. So Jesus said, look, our sin, we were here, but because of him, we are changed. So hopefully, if you know Christ, you are not the man, you are not the woman you used to be. The thoughts you used to have running in your mind are no longer there. The activities you were involved in and I were involved in, hopefully we're not doing those anymore. And as we go forward, we get to tell people, look, I get it. It looks bad, and you might think I can never change, and I can never get victory, and this will, I'll always be like this. And we get to say, look, that's not true because in Jesus Christ, I can do all things. That because of Jesus, I become a new person. And we thank God for that. But our job is to be that representation, that message, that billboard, that light. So when you go back to John chapter 15, that's really what Jesus is trying to get us to understand. A Christian is always to produce evidence of his relationship. Jesus is not asking for secret disciples. Jesus doesn't got some kind of secret Christian FBI thing going on. He wants us to represent him in everything that we do. And he wants us to reproduce. Not only should we look and talk like Christians, but we should also be able to help point people and bring people to Christ. Right? Cattle reproduce cows. Pigs reproduce pigs. Christians should reproduce other Christians. We're told to be a light in the world so that people can glorify God through our good works. We're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So, a couple observations from Jesus here in John 15. Notice Jesus says he wants us to bring forth fruit. Notice in verse 16, John 15 and verse 16. Here's what Jesus said. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and I've ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. And that your fruit should remain. So that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. I have sought you. I have always been working. 
We talked about that a few weeks ago. God has always had a plan for your life. He's still working that plan, and he has a future plan already in place. And he drew us, and he worked in us, and when we came to faith, he quickened us and made us alive and made us a new creature in Christ, and he continues to work. Many of you know Ephesians 2 and verse 8 and 9. We quote them all the time. It's by grace we're saved through faith, not ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But verse 10 would say, for we're his workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus unto good works which the Father hath already before ordained that we should walk in them. God already has a plan for you. He already has people lined up that he wants you and he wants me to influence, to point to Jesus. And and he's going to make us and mold us and work on us so that we can produce fruit. That's his desire. Not just some fruit, but more, much fruit. Here's another observation. If you look at John 14, notice in verse 2, God is always working in our lives. Verse 2, every branch that is in me. So we'll start there. Those who are in me, okay, not branch of some other tree, those who are in me. So he's really speaking about believers at this point, but that bears not fruit He takes away. In essence, he shelves them. Now, a lot of people will use this verse to say, look, if you're not producing, then boom, you lose this salvation that God gave you. That's really, you'd have to remove so many other promises and assurances in Scripture. That's not really what it's saying. There are a couple of things, though, that I think are true. One, he says, look, if you are in me, he qualifies it, but you are not producing, you're shriveling, you're dying, then then you get pushed to the side. Paul would say it this way, we are all vessels, some of us to honor, some of us to dishonor. And when God sees, he's like, what's going on? You're not growing, You're, you're, you're not walking close with me. Then God says, look, there was an opportunity, this was my plan for you, but you're not anywhere in a position to be able to fulfill that plan. You've missed the opportunity, you missed the potential blessing. And and God, if you will, puts us to the side. We get shelved for a while. But I think as you continue to read this lesson, you can definitely infer, I think, this underlying truth, and that is this, where Jesus said, look, if you are really, truly in me, you will bring forth fruit. And if you are not consistently producing and growing and changing and bringing forth fruit, then maybe you need to really do a heart look and, and, and to evaluate because maybe you are not even in me. And I think that you see that inference in this teaching. He's always working. So how does he work in the one who's like, oh God, I'm kind of doing my thing, I'm distracted, I'm kind of going my way, and we, we're like that. I don't know that many of us get up and say, hey God, I'm really not interested in being close to you today, I'm really not interested. We just, we get busy, and we do our thing, and meanwhile God's like, oh, here's an opportunity, oh, you missed it. Oh, I really want you to do, oh, you can't do that. You're in no position to do that. And we miss what God has for us. So what does God do? He works and he convicts us. That's the spirit. And he reminds us and he teaches us and he prods us and he chastens us. We don't like discipline, but it's part of the process. And he pokes and he pokes and he reminds us because he loves us too much just to say, I don't care, do whatever you want to do. Well, you might say, man, I'm really glad I'm not over there. By the way, if we are here, thanks be to God, we can, we can say, God, forgive me. And God, work in me. I want to bring, for, bring forth fruit. I want to grow. I want to be close to you. And he'll help us to do that. Maybe you're thinking, I'm glad I'm not there, so I don't want the discipline. I don't want God messing with me. I just kind of want to be left alone. God never leaves us alone. Because notice verse 2, he says, if, if you're not bringing forth fruit, then I'm going to set you aside, but every branch that does bear fruit, I'm going to purge it. I'm going to prune it. I'm going to cleanse you so that you can bring forth more fruit. If you're a gardener, you understand all those beautiful flowers have to be cut back at some point so that in spring they grow back even more beautiful. And God is always working on us. How many of you would agree there are still areas in life in which God can still work in your life? 
And you're like, God, I mean, come on. This is like some unachievable, some unimaginable. God is still working in us. Why? Because he knows I can produce more fruit. I can produce more fruit. I can, I can reach more people through you. And so I'm going to keep working on you. I'm not going to let you sit. I'm not just going to let you do nothing. So if he's going to work on me one way or the other, I think I'd rather be here than having me, him chase me down. If you'll look in verse number 11, why do we do all of this? In verse 11, we're told, here's why. Jesus said, I've spoken all these things to you so that your joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Because here's the reality. If I saved you, I have a purpose for you. If you will let me work in you, teach you, correct you, guide you, redirect you, and you listen and you follow, I will produce spiritual fruit. You'll grow in your life, and the result will be joy that comes from God. All the money in the world won't be able to buy this joy. All my accomplishments won't be able to achieve that joy. It's not going to be a little joy. Oh, there's a glimpse. It will be full because God is having his way in my life. And sometimes we follow, and we've talked about that in recent weeks, our own agenda, our own ideas, what the world and culture has said, this is where joy is. But for the Christian, joy comes from the Lord. So the question is, am I bringing forth spiritual fruit in my life? How do I do that? That's the million dollar question. And I want to leave you this thought. If I'm going to produce and grow and bring forth fruit, I have to abide in Christ. That simple. Notice what Jesus says in verse 4. Abide in me, verse 4, and I in you. Remain. It means to stay in a current place. Hey, those of us who live here in New York, you know how valuable a good parking space is. Yes? Now, let's be honest. How many of you have ever said, this is a great place to park and I got it. I am not moving my car for any reason. Somebody better be dying before I move my car. I've had people call me and ask for rides to church, and I know they have a car. Well, your car broken down? No, no. What's, well, I, I don't want to lose the primo parking spot that I have. Okay, I don't know. all right. I'll be glad to move my car and, and, and see if I can make that happen. To remain, to stay in that place, that top button we're talking about is abiding with Jesus remaining close to him. And if I get that right, everything else will, 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 will match up. My relationships, my job, my money, my thoughts, it'll all fall into place. And I'm trying to fix my money and I'm trying to fix this relationship. And, 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 and honestly, I'm not abiding in Christ, so it's never going to be right. So Jesus said, here's what you have to understand. If you're not remaining with me, close to me, remember, I'm the base I'm the trunk. You're the branch. You get your strength from me. There is no power without Jesus that I cannot do anything without him. I definitely can't live a Christian life without him. How many people try to live Christian-like and they don't even know Jesus? They're trying to do what they think God would want them to do, and what happens? Life happens, and people come by, and buttons get pushed, and it's so frustrating. As a Christian, we want to revert back to that. We want to act like our natural self. The only way that we're able to produce and bring forth fruit is if we stay closely connected with Jesus, to abide with him, to to spend our time with him. How do we do that? Super simple. You can think, man, this is so elementary. But we got to pray. I appreciate the prayer today, Taz. That was great. We talk to God. Yes, God knows all of our problems. He knows what we need. But we have that opportunity because he wants us to feel that we can talk to him. I'm super glad. He's not like, hey, you be quiet. I do all the talking. He wants us to talk. But by the same token, 
He needs to have a voice in our lives. And so often we're really good about talking, 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 but we never listen to what he has to say. And any good relationship goes both ways. So how does God speak? All through history, God spoke through signs and wonders and visions and dreams and donkeys and bushes and prophets. But now we have a Bible. And you and I get the privilege of opening it or, or opening it on our, our, our phones. And we can read it anytime, anywhere, as much as we want. And God will speak. Verse number three. And that's exactly what he says. If you want to stay close to me, then you need to listen to my word. It's, it's really baffling when you think about it. We're out there trying to live like little Jesus is, and we're not even consulting him at all. We're just kind of doing what we think is best. How foolish is that? You are clean through the word which I've spoken. So I need to listen to him. So yes, pray, but also let him speak into your life. goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. If you're not reading the Bible, the scriptures, you must begin to do that. Wherever we are, keep it and try to increase. Go to that next step. There are so many great devotionals, so many great methods. There's really no excuse for us as a Christian not to be able to find the time or the way to let God speak into our lives. And if he's speaking, here's what we're going to find. His word is pure. He will always speak to make us clean and pure. Always. When I was a kid, especially in summertime, I would just be outside all day. I'd play in the dirt. When I was real little, I'd eat dirt. I would just do everything in the dirt. And to try to get me to take a bath or a shower, that was just like, you know, one of the seven wonders of the world in the summertime when I was a little kid. And I can remember a lot of times, oh, who cares, you're just running around the neighborhood. But then when it would come time for, hey, you got to go with mom, we're going out to the store, or we got to go see some people, she'd get me out and she'd actually see me in the light of day and, whoa, you are not going out like this. You know, you're going to put a hat on your head, we got to wash your face. I didn't care, I love the dirt. But no, 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 it is not presentable. When I read the scriptures, what happens, God begins to speak, and you know what he says? You are not presentable, Dan Schaefer. You cannot go to work in that frame of mind today. That is not acceptable. Hey, you cannot have that conversation with your wife like you are right now. Absolutely not. No, you cannot make that decision. That is going to be the worst decision you can make. When we read the scriptures, that's the kind of information that God gives to us. And it's always meant to clean us and to purify us and make us better. Not only is the word pure, but the word gives us all of God's promises. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for the promises of God. Because, you know, it's hard to live according to Jesus' ways sometimes in an ungodly world. And that's where if I'm listening, he becomes my biggest cheerleader, my, my biggest fan, my best friend. He's my heavenly father, and he's encouraging me and reminding me, look, you can do all things through Christ, and I will never leave you. And if God be for me, who can be against me? And I always love you, and it will be worth it all. And he reminds us of those things if I'm listening. You know, Jesus never said that to, to follow him and to bring forth fruit would be easy. As a matter of fact, he said it would be hard. John Bunyan, who wrote the very famous book, Pilgrim's Progress, he once said this, It is said that in some countries trees will grow, but they will bear no fruit because there is no winter there. Winter time. The trees lose their leaves, their fruit, it all dies. So that what happens in the spring, it can all come back more lovely, more productive than it was months before. Look, there are going to be those winter times, those valley times, those hardship times in our life. Uh, we've said this before, but if you've ever seen big mountains like the Rocky Mountains, anything over 10,000 feet, they're beautiful, they're majestic. But what you realize is when you get up that high, all it is is rock and stone and snow and ice. There, there are no crops up there. Where are the crops? Down in the valley. 
You and I have to be in the valleys because God said that's where we'll be most productive. That's why David said, so even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I won't fear evil because you're with me. So it's hard, and it's hard to witness to people, and it's hard to be a Christian when everybody in my family is not a Christian, and it's hard to go to work and try to do the right thing, and it's hard to stay close to God when I'm being tempted all along, and I get that. But God, you speak, you speak, and as he speaks, he cleans me, and he teaches me, and he encourages me, and reminds me, I know it's hard, child, but I'm with you, and I'm going to walk with you, and I'll get you through this. And in the meanwhile, you're going to produce You're going to bring forth so much fruit, and people will be pointed to me. And that's the plan. That's the plan of his word. And that's why he says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. If I'm close to the vine, as I'm growing, he's teaching me, I'm listening, he's encouraging me, and now he says, take this and go act upon it. Go do what I have asked of you to do. Follow through. Act in obedience. So the question today is for you and for me, are we bearing much fruit? Are we reproducing? Can Christ be seen in us? Not because, wow, we're super talented and super, it's all Jesus, but I will only grow and produce as I get close to him. Am I drawing closer to him every day? Is that my aspiration? Is that my desire? Am I letting him speak? Am I listening? Am I accepting it? Am I then responding to that in my life? And if I'll do that, I will make such a difference to people around me. God will be glorified, and I will have blessing. I won't miss opportunities. God's plan for my life will be worked. It'll be fulfilled. And I'll be blessed if I'm willing to spiritually grow in my life. So that's the challenge today. May God help us to be willing to produce and bring forth much fruit. And if you don't know Jesus today, you don't have that relationship, step one is to turn to him and allow him to be your savior. Repent and believe, and he'll change your life forever. Let's bow our heads for prayer, please. Heads are bowed. In just a moment, we'll close with prayer, but maybe you're, you, you need to just take a couple minutes today and pray. Brian's just going to play a verse of invitation. If you need to come talk with somebody, you need to come here and pray. I want to encourage you to do that. There where you sit in a moment when we stand. If God's speaking to your heart today, would you say, okay, Lord, I'm going to quit fighting it. Okay, God, I'm sorry. God, I want to be close to you. The great thing is God forgives and he cleanses and he picks us up and he puts us back on that track. Today, are you abiding in him? Who is the loudest voice in your life? What is the greatest influence in your life? I know what the official answer is, but is it true? Are we trying to fix everything else and change everything else without connecting more deeply with the Lord? Are we letting him speak into our lives? Today, that's his desire And the reality is we have no power, we have no ability, no blessing if we don't abide in him. May God help us today. I wonder with heads bowed, if you're here, just say, Pastor, pray for me. I just need to work through some things in my life. Please pray for me today. God's speaking to me. Just slip your hand up and put it down so I can pray. God bless you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe you're here today and you say, God bless you. You say, I don't know Jesus as my Savior. If I died, I don't know where I would go. I don't know that I'm forgiven. I don't know about uh, eternal life, but I'd really like to know that. Look, Jesus came to offer eternal life and forgiveness for you and for me. I wonder if you're here and you say, I'm just not certain of any of that, but I have questions. And Pastor, I'm at least going to ask you to remember me. Would you pray for me? If that's your testimony, would you slip your hand and put it down just long enough for me to see? God bless. Thanks. Pray for me. I'm not sure about my salvation, my eternity. Look, we'd be glad and would be privileged and honored to talk with you today. If God speaks to your heart, I pray that you'll respond to him and to his leading in your life today. And let God have his will and let God have his way. Let's stand for prayer. Can we do that?
Lord, I pray that you would bless today and work in our hearts as we take a moment today and just search our hearts, Lord. I pray that you would help us to be honest and be willing to respond to you. Lord, I pray for those who may be here that don't know you as Savior, that today would be that day they'll talk with someone and, Lord, they'd be willing to, to hear and, Lord, that their hearts would be prepared and they might put their trust in you. Lord, I pray for believers, for Christians who maybe are struggling in life and we're trying to take care of everything else, but we've forgotten to be close to you. Lord, I don't think we do it on purpose, but help us to read your word and love it and cherish it and let you speak into our lives. Listen to you so that, Lord, we can honor you, represent you, and bring forth fruit. Bless those that raised a hand. You know what the burdens and the needs are. Pray today, Lord, that they would just talk with you about it. And I pray that your will and way would be done. So, Lord, I bless us as we take a moment today. Work in hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, heads are bowed. Let's just take a moment there where you stand. If you need to come pray, you do that. You need to talk with someone, you come. We'll have someone pray with you, but we won't tarry long. Just take a minute today as we get ready to close, but let's just search our hearts today and pray. Lord, I thank you for your word and I just pray that you would help us, Lord, to respond as you have worked and will allow you to continue to work and lead in our life. Thank you that you never give up and you're always doing something to produce more fruit in us. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us to abide in you. Lord, as we dismiss here in a moment, I pray that you will send us home with your blessing. God, I pray today that uh, you would help uh, us to represent you. Bless us as for many we go back into a work week or go back into a home situation. And Lord, we know problems are all around us. Let us keep our eyes on you. Lord, I pray that uh, you'll be glorified in all that we do. Pray you'll bless the, this group from Sunnyside. Lord, give them a safe trip back tomorrow and thank you for the blessing they've been. Bless our other guests as well today. Help them feel welcome and Glad that they were here. Lord, bless our offering and folks as they give. Bless what's given. Meet the needs here and around the world. Lord, we just pray for all the ministry that will take place later today. God, be honored. Be glorified, we pray. We love you and we thank you. Send us home with your blessings now, we ask. And we ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen. amen.